Very good. I see some are very tired and leaving. That's fine. I don't take it personally. <laughs> so I love, I always love these leaves. It's cool. It's autumn. Anyway, um, I'm Peter Neeler. Um, and um, I have a small confession to make. I think I must be mad. I must be mad because I started to develop for virtual reality already before Oculus started. So I got this crazy idea about this locomotion system, and we started to build for virtual reality. And when Oculus came, then I was like, wow, this thing is really happening. Now, to get everyone on the same page, though you know, I'm really grateful the panelists made a really good intro into what is or isn't virtual reality. Uh, but just to get everybody on the same page, I would like to sh play a short clip that would introduce a little better. Virtual reality creates a perception of being somewhere else or someone else. All that is enabled by the fusion of technology and psychology. What is reality anyway? The brain creates experiences and predicts the future based on previous knowledge and input information from our senses. Tricking our senses and fulfilling our brain's predictions, it is possible to change that moment-to-moment -moment perception much of the information on the external world we get visually. VR goggles display for each eye a slightly different image, creating a three-dimensional experience. By adding more tricks related to hearing and body awareness, and timing those exactly how our brain would predict, many automatic brain processes activate, so the feeling of virtual reality grows stronger and stronger. Taking off the VR goggles, the user is safely back to our home environment. That will always be the brightest experience. So, I pressed the wrong button now. Get it back up, please. Good. So, virtual reality, in my view, is kind of like this Pandora's box. We don't know yet what will fly out of it. But we know that those areas will definitely be used, actually, the industry. And um, which is more, even more interesting than the areas uh, marked in this slide, are the areas we don't even imagine yet. So just like with previous platforms like, 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 like mobile phones, like smartphones, like you didn't know what will be made. But um, I would like to quote a movie because it's after all a film festival. Ah, good. Uh, from uh, The Lone Mourner Man, um, a classic, um, classic horror flick from uh, Stephen King, uh, that I believe that one of the very important drivers of VR will be actually the same industry that helped VHS win the tape war in the 80s. So, by the way, um, one of the co-creators of that movie, the classic uh, legendary movie, David Tropp, should be in the room. Hi, David. So, <laughs> um, now I'm going to talk about motion capture. Motion capture is something we started to build for virtual reality, but we decided to make it more wide and widely used. So motion capture is, in a way, giving life to otherwise lifeless digital avatar. So it's tracking your movements and transferring them to virtual avatar or character. Uh, I think many, many of you know as you're a film craft. And motion capture can be used in many, many fields, but not just games and entertainment, but also including sports, analytics, rehabilitation, and again, many more fields we do not yet know. So, and also virtual reality. The experience centers, motion capture is needed for these, 
experience centers. But I will talk about experience centers more later. Today, motion capture is, um, uh, is, is, is made mostly optically, meaning that the person being tracked is wearing reflective markers in a big studio covered with cameras. And we have built a system that is independent of any visual tracking or any cameras or anything external besides just one receiver because it's sensor-based. That is me in the screen moving around and because I'm wired to virtual reality I can see myself. I can see what I do and what I don't do. So all the, the, the only wire is, is the headset's wire. Everything else is wireless. Here's a, a, just a short overview. And what makes us unique in terms of competition, not to mention the optical one I just showed you, but in terms of other uh, sensor-based solutions, is that we have every sensor wireless, making it much more usable, much more durable, much more convenient, and so on. So, <laughs> I thought someone was laughing. <laughs> cool. Anyway, anyway, laughing is okay, uh, and everything else is also okay. <laughs> uh, so, what I wanted to direct my attention to, the other output of this market space is huge. This is only output. This is not the size of motion capture market, which is measured only 80 million. Output, however, in different sectors, combining close to $400 billion. So, wh why is that? Well, my theory is that this industry is stagnated in many ways. Meaning that, that because of this traditional way of motion capture being so expensive, and many people and companies not being able to afford it, it could be much bigger and much more widely used market space. So, here is just one small photograph of Game Developers Conference in uh, San Francisco. And this is one alleyway, and there were about 27,000 game developers. And trust me, most of them were indie developers. But indie developers cannot afford the big and expensive studios. So we are here to disrupt that market, to bring that technology costing only a few thousand euros instead of tens or hundreds of thousands of euros, sometimes millions, bring it to everybody who might need that. Indie developers, indie filmmakers, indie anything. You need motion capture, it's affordable, it's yours, and it fits in a box. Why am I so sure I'm succeeding? That I'm, I'm doing the right thing here? Well, one of the reasons is that I have a really good hunch. I mean, I had, I had this hunch so many times. But the other thing is that technology just develops. Because you're a film crowd, you understand what I'm showing you. I'm showing you a film camera, I'm showing you a DVI camera, uh, the, the, the tape camera, right? And then I'm showing you Red One. Red One, digital cinema, that's, that's the present now. That's not the future anymore. Well, the same thing will happen in motion capture. Not just in VR, but everywhere. And what we are basically doing with this motion capture is that we are turning this into that. So, another technology uh, we have in development is position tracking. Position tracking is that you're wearing a small sensor and then in an area of up to two football fields, you can be tracked, your position can be mapped in precision of 10 centimeters. That is uh, very usable in many, many fields. Like, I always like to say that the best virtual reality is when you close your eyes and dream. If you would close your eyes and dream about a fireman in a building, you would understand that the fireman doesn't see where other firemen are. He's not seen. So, for example, the position technology can be used in such occasion. 
or for tracking soccer players or anybody pretty much, even marathon, you can see in real time. So that's one thing. But what this technology combined with our motion capture, that's why it's called VR mo motion capture, by the way. Mo Mocap is the short form of motion capture. What these two technologies as combined can do is that they can be used in virtual reality experience centers. And many wonder what that is. Well, let me show you a short clip what virtual reality experience center is going to be. This is from American company Void. So, these things will be popping up all over the planet soon. And our technology is one of the ways of solving this problem, making this happen. Obviously, we're not the only one. So, Griffin is not your ordinary startup. I mean, I don't even consider us startups, because I think that we're visionaries, scientists, madmen. So, we have built already existing functioning prototype of a locomotion platform runpad. We have, we have released free tools to virtual reality developers. And which is the most interesting is that we have established or founded what we call virtual neuroscience lab. Now, ladies and gentlemen, things get really interesting. So as always, things start with two people meeting. Maris Wasser on the left is by now a good friend of mine and we met earlier this year and he was doing his thesis in psychology and virtual reality. Researching change blindness. And he had this group of other scientists, some PhDs, some not, who were all really excited about virtual reality. And when we spoke about a few things, we realize that we, are, we have exactly similar visions about what should be researched and how. One of the things being immersion. Immersion is a very important matter. So, Virtual Neuroscience Lab was founded. Now, This is one of our favorite uh, quotes, kind of like um, a tagline. Though since, it's a, since it is a, a, a film, film conference, a film festival, I would also like to add another, another quote which is really relevant. And it's from Adre Lojoes, Open Your Eyes. And it is, your subconscious is a very powerful thing. These are visual tricks. Anyone can Google and find, including those clips, what are optical illusions. Why is that so? Well, in the clip beginning my talk, we spoke about brain predicting things. That's exactly what it does. The more experienced we get, the stronger is the machine learning side. The more we skip and the more we generalize. In other words, the more 
we predict. We think that these were going in circle. They weren't. So these are all optical tricks. But what we were really interested in was haptics. Haptics is a very big problem of virtual reality. It's how to touch things, how to feel stuff. And that's something that we completely agreed with, Matisse, that haptics has to be researched. And we call that neurohaptics. That picture here creates in most of you unpleasant feeling. Why is that? Why? It has nothing to do with you. It's on the screen. It can't do anything to you. It's just, it's just a very basic example of that prediction again. And when we take that prediction and we understand it's, it's widely used in movies, in horror movies and, and other movies, like how, how, how with sounds and then visuals we are influenced. So we can take that experience and make it neurohaptic. So what we have is a neurohaptic programming. We are researching that field right now. There's still way to go, but how it works. You have this list of events on the slide. But let me make it less dry, more figurative for you. So let's imagine that you're immersed into this virtual reality and you have mosquitoes flying all over you. Now, we have attached, let's say, some wires with electric impulses on you. Very slight bites. And the mosquito would fly and land, in, land on your neck, for example, and you would feel the bite because we place the sensor here. Or fly to another place. But overall, we will decrease and decrease the effect of sound, so the effect of bite, and increase the other audiovisual immersive effect. So eventually, we will cut off the tactile or haptic feedback at all, making you believe that what's happening to you is real until we can expand that to other places of your body. So this is kind of the research we're making. And that's why it's called programming. Here's a short clip of a gaming meetup where we tested some stuff on the people, and you can see here a girl reaching out her hands, and boom, fire. So once, it, once it's convincing enough, most of the work is done already. Once we will add neurohaptic programming to it, we can make much more. And I think, because we are kind of computers that use machine learning to predict things and optimize our experience, we can hack into that automation process and get people to feel stuff in virtual reality, hopefully without anything attached, besides headsets and earphones, of course. So, We're doing this motion capture, we're doing this positioning, and we're doing this scientific research in virtual reality with Neuroscience Lab. I hope my talk was interesting. Uh, I hope that you think that I'm not completely crazy, or if you do, I will try to take it as a compliment. Thank you very much. Um, please get to me. I will be in the building all day and some of the day, some some of tomorrow. And just grab me on the hallway. <laughs> I'm very open and accessible. And uh, and find my name. My name is Peter Neeler. Uh, you can find me from social media and LinkedIn. And get back to me with any ideas, collaboration, or questions. Do we have time for Q and A, or I'll do that privately with everybody? You, you must be tired, right? There's...
a very urgent question. Is there any urgent questions <laughs> that would be also interesting for others? Um, maybe, maybe one. Yes, why not? Uh, uh, glasses, probably yes, but we're yes. We can, we can, we can, we can give it a try. No problem, please. And we are, we are, we are present downstairs. We have um, uh, this. Um, we have this made this lounge called not VIP but EIU, meaning everyone is unique. So everyone is welcome. Please come and uh, and go ahead without mic. I will. How a very good question. Who has half an hour? <laughs> anyway, um, let's put it this way: that um, um, I have mixed emotions about. There are there are so many ways to torture people. We are like in the middle in the Middle Ages. They were really good at it. So we have much more authentic technology from there to take. We don't need to do all that R and D. But I got your point. Uh, the point of the of the of the ethics, or also spoken about as empathy. You know, um, there was there was all this big article about Chris Milk who, who was mentioned earlier, and about his uh, VR um, VR. Uh, let's say, movies uh, shot in the refugee camps and how ethical is it? And, and how, how, sorry, how, how it enhances the empathy because you can be there and you can be almost experiencing what they do. However, on the other side of the co coin, we have all the rest of the entertainment industry. And now imagine, I mean, everybody knows probably GTA, right? Imagine you're pay paying GTA 20 in VR, you're killing people, and it's really realistic. That's just, just shooting a clerk in the shop, or just don't like his face, bang. Now, we, we, we get to this point where we have been before, which is video games drive people crazy, and, uh, and they really haven't, but with, would VR do that? I doubt. I, I, I still think that people who have the, the tendency to go crazy find a way to go crazy, and the people who don't are pretty safe to others. Uh, thank you very much.